And welcome to Bronze and Modern Gods. I'm John, and I'm here with Richard. What's going on, Richard? Nothing much. How are you doing? <laughs> We're doing okay. We've got a jam-packed episode this week, so I don't want to waste any time. We're going to get right into it. Hey, if you're not following us on Facebook or Instagram, make sure you are at Bronze and Modern Gods. You can do that. It's probably a good idea to do that because we've got a lot of stuff coming up in the month of September that you want to make sure that you're a part of. If you're watching us on YouTube, give us a like and subscribe. We love you for it. Leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform if you're listening there. If you are listening to the podcast, version of this week's episode i highly recommend that when we get to the part about comic book cpr that you you skip ahead 20 minutes listen to the rest of the podcast then come join us on youtube so you can see the visual it's a very visual episode this week so uh we don't want you to miss out before we get started let's talk about our nerd shirts richard what do you got this week anything did you go shopping no actually this is comes comes from my closet and i've got a a blizzcon t-shirt from this is either 2017 or 2015. I've got a couple of them. That is nerdy. I have my <laughs> Liberty hold on, yeah, my Liberty Legion T-shirt drawn by Jack Kirby, the from the uh, Marvel premiere two-part tryout from the 70s. I'm going deep. This is a yes, deep you are. This week. That uh, is definitely that is definitely a hardcore shirt. Nothing like an Invaders spinoff team. To have <laughs> it's like uh, a spinoff of a D team, D list team. Hey, hey, <laughs> uh, just a heads up for everyone I am hosting a live sale for Minor Keys Comics this week, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, it is everything for $10. He's going to have a sale of over 300 books, all at $10 a piece. He asked me to host it. He's apparently a glutton for punishment because I will not do this without being snarky the whole way throughout. So make sure you join us uh, at Minor Keys Comics on Instagram. So make a note of it. Our hot book this week, Richard, let's get to it. it kind of an obvious one. Why don't you tell the folks what it is? It is Giant Size X-Men number one. It is the elephant in the room this particular week. And why is that? So there's a major sale this week. Right, Heritage Auctions, which is a big auction house that sells high-end comic books, sold a record-breaking 9.8 Giant Size X-Men at $19,200 after the buyer's premium. That is amazing. That is an amazing price for a book, and it's a huge jump over the previous high high price. Did it have white pages? <laughs> for that price, it better well have, have white pages for sure. <laughs> For that price, you <laughs> very better deliver it by hand. I don't think we have to tell people to listen to this podcast why this is an important book, but let's do it anyway. It is the first appearance of the new X-Men, written by Len Wein, illustrated by Dave Cockrum, pretty much changed comics forever, in starting in the Bronze Age to this very day. It is the third major X-Men key behind X-Men number one, and arguably Hulk 181, X-Men 94 is a lesser book. I think this is the one everybody wants. Right. You, first appearance of Storm, first appearance of Nightcrawler, first appearance of Colossus, first appearance of Thunderbird, Core 40 for Thunderbird. Yeah. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> Always an also ran. Someone had to be sacrificed, but uh, you know it wasn't going to be Wolverine. For the previous issues back before 94, 94 came out, just after Giant Size, it was a bunch of re reprints. They had no new stories for, I, I forget how many issues. Five years. You know, the book had seen better days. Uh, it was canceled. It was the low, always one of the lowest selling Marvel superhero titles. That and Strange Tales kind of took turns being the lowest sellers. And in 1970, you know, X-Men went to reprint. And it stayed that way for a full five years. And this was actually an idea from the higher ups at marvel's parent company cadence they were having very strong international sales for marvel comics and they wanted an international team that they could take to foreign uh comic companies and sell them the reprints and that's where the new x-men started yeah you uh, mentioned that you had a, an x-men i i grade x-men giant size x-men number one what what exactly happened there john i hate you <laughs> I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Uh, 
Richard's teasing me because I had a slabbed 9.4 with bone white pages last year around this time. I think it was in September. I sold that book for what I thought at the time was a whopping $3,499. And boy, do I feel stupid today. But to be fair, I was only in that book for about $1,000. So I made a pretty good coin off of it. But boy, I kind of wish I held on to it after this week. Yeah, I you know we all have those books regret selling. I had a uh, Ultima Fallout 4 uh, variant cover that was a 9.8 that I sold for $2,100. You never know. You never know the future. Like you said, if, if you came into it low and you sold it for a profit, a significant profit, then just don't look back. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, ways to maximize your profit if you really want to break it down to the coldest, most calculating portions of the hot. <laughs> but, you know, we're not afraid to do that. Uh, we've got, a, the, of course, the 25 year rule, our regular uh, feature coming up. We've got our underrated books of the week coming up. But the majority of this episode is devoted to comic book CPR. And in this case, CPR stands for crack. Press and resubmit. We're going to take you on a journey. Now, uh, we wanted to show you guys a little bit of this process that sometimes a lot of dealers and people go through, even collectors. I'm one of them. I, I kind of take a close eye and take a close look at some of the books that are being sold that are slabbed. And if I see defects that are easily corrected, I will buy a book, crack that sucker open, take care of those defects and resubmit it, especially for my personal collection. So I wanted to show you guys this process and take you on this journey and you can see the end result with us as we go along. Now the book I picked, you'll see, we tried to get graders notes from CGC this weekend so we could tell you what the graders saw as the flaws. For some reason, the graders notes aren't working. Each of us, Richard and I both paid $5 each and we got nothing, <laughs> no email. So I'm calling CGC tomorrow to see what's up. This is not meant to be a literal step-by-step. -step. And by that, I mean, we're gonna show you the process, but I'm not gonna go into detail about everything. The one thing I can do is if you're really interested in learning how to press your own books and clean your own books and do this sort of thing, I cannot recommend it enough. You've heard me guys say it before. I'm going to say it again. Follow Captain Mike, Captain with a K, Mike with a Y, all one word on Facebook, Captain Mike's Pressing Group on Facebook. I'll have a link in the description and in the show notes. He has a book that he calls Comic Book CPR. Uh, it, it tells you every single thing you need to know. He's got videos on YouTube that walk you through the process. And I don't know about you, Richard, but this book and this process really changed the way I press and collect. Yeah, it, it changes the way you submit books to CGC. I mean, there is no excuse now not to have the book in its optimal condition. You, know, you may buy a book that's of a lower grade. By pressing it, you can bring that grade up, hopefully, and, and go from a maybe a 9.0 to a 9.2 or a 9.4. It's, it's an amazing tool and it really maximizes your submissions. I, I've been in this game long enough that I remember the furor over pressing uh, on the CGC boards back in the day, you know, just around people were super offended that people would actually press comic books and it was seen as some by some people as cheating gaming the system and some people insisted it was restoration this was like 20 years ago 15 years ago and i kind of sat back and the fallout the, the fans and the collectors made their voices heard this is kind of the norm now if you don't do it people are kind of looking at you like why aren't you pressing that book especially with moderns right moderns uh the difference between a nine six and a nine eight for a modern are just little tiny imperfections and you can take a, a, a book that is a potential 9.6 and press it and move it up to be a 9.8. Right over there. Yeah, it's, you know, you have 9.8 potential. Yeah, you can get rid of all those tiny little imperfections that, that always show up in a book that's been handled by people. Especially and, uh, the Marvels now. The Marvels are being printed on crap paper. And I say that with love, Marvel. They're using the crappiest paper stock right now. I don't know if it's a cost savings move or if it actually just accepts the color better. But if you look at your comics when you get them home and you're thinking, oh, I got a slam dunk 9.8. Flip it over, take a look at it in the light. You'll see all these little ripples, these little waves that are easily pressed out. 
But right. you know, we're not gonna get into this. The thing about pressing, the ethics, whatever, we're not gonna get into that. We're just gonna show you what we're doing here. And everyone has their own comfort level. If you're gonna get into this, please don't start with your copy of Amazing Fantasy 15. <laughs> uh, you're not gonna have a lot of luck there. Buy some dollar books, practice first. Right. Everyone has their own comfort level. This guy right here refuses to press his own modern books i do i it, and it's 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 a weakness on, on my part um mainly because i have attempted to press modern books and i use too much heat or too much pressure and i end up with basically a frisbee so it's it's something that i need to practice with uh i definitely will not do my own uh, high-end uh modern books but I'm going to practice and get better at the whole process. Sorry, you just started like a couple of years ago. So I understand. I, I mean, I've been pressing for 10 years now. So, and I'm still learning. That's why I love that Captain Mike book. I, I've learned things yeah. that I never knew before. It really is an art. And, you know, it's 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 an art more than a science. And then it's different books to have different processes. And the tools that professional pressers use, like ball bearings. And it's amazing. That's the things that they've have come about to help them remove dimples and other flaws in the cover of a book. Here's the thing. We're going to show you this little video that I made. I've been doing this a while. I've ruined a lot of books. Luckily, I've ruined a lot of quarter books. I've learned ruined a lot of 50 cent books, dollar books. You have to practice this. Don't watch this video and then just go and crush your books and then say, John and Richard screwed me. We're not taking responsibility if you ruin your books. Right. And watch the video once, watch it twice, watch it three times before you actually go through the process. Because there are a lot of places in this in the process that you could ruin your book. And we want you to be careful about your collection. Yeah, again, this is just to show you the process. It's not a step-by-step. -step, it's not a how-to. It's, hey, I'm going to do this, go through this experience together, and we'll see what the result is. So right. roll that beautiful bean footage. So the book that we're going to experiment with is Strange Tales 114. I got this uh, on an auction site. It looked good. And when I got it in hand, I got a good deal on it. I noticed things like this. In the back, see these deep creases on the back cover? Those are definitely improvable with a press. And you've got a few other things on the front here that could be improved. So what we're gonna do is crack, press, and then resubmit this. You can also see there's some dirt here that we're gonna try to get off. Right now it's a 4.5. So we're gonna experiment together and see if we can bump this up uh, a half point or two. So let's get started. So the first thing you wanna do is crack it out of the slab. And there is a really good method for doing this. And that is you kinda of take it and you gotta get it loose a little bit first. You kinda of give it a little twist. Hear that crack? That's what you wanna hear. That's kind of breaking the posts at the corners where it's sealed. And it's also giving you a little room near the top, a little wiggle room to get your screwdriver in. You take your screwdriver and you kinda of get it in there like this on the top. Kinda of gotta give it a little crack, you'll hear it. And then you can shimmy it through here along the side like this Get my hand out of the way and you hear more cracking there we go and get it down the side and as you're doing this twist your screwdriver towards the outside edge so you can keep cracking it all the way down the side like this and then do the same for the other side definitely take out the label at this point and put that aside and save it. Because you're gonna want to uh, compare your work when the slab gets back. So now we're going to the other side, this, doing the same thing down this side. You're just shimming it down and you're rotating to the outside all the way down. Like that, so you get to the end. At this point, you should be able to open the book, or open the slab, and gently remove your book. Gently. Ta-da! Now this next part is tricky. You really want a new, fresh X-Acto blade. Don't 
use a dull one. Don't try to save money. This is the important part where you really want to take care of your book. And you're going to gently, slowly remove the book from the inner well by cutting along the side. This is dangerous, so not for the faint of heart. And along the top as well. Just make sure you don't get near the edge of the book. That's a nightmare. little bit right here I want to get there we go and just to be safe I'm gonna shimmy it down a little bit from here and get some of this side off as well being careful to stay away from the spine that is the most uh, nerve-wracking moment of this whole process. So don't be afraid to stop, breathe, and take your time. And as you can see, now we've got the book out. Boy, it smells like a comic book. At this point, you want your gloves on. Get your gloves, um, because you're gonna be handling the book. And I just wanna show, show it off to the camera here. You can probably see where, if I can catch the light, there are some pressable defects on the front cover around here. It looks like someone tried to press this before and did not have a lot of success. It's a little wavy across the top. There's a big fold in the middle, but we can do a better job. That's why we're doing some CPR here. We can do a much better job here. Yeah, it looks like the entire book, if you can see here, was folded along the entire back here and they tried to press that out and you can see these really just really deep indentions that definitely we can press these out no problem I have faith but first let's remove the uh, archival paper inside you should find that and remove it because you don't want that in the humidity chamber with you Ooh, this book smells like an old funny book. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I can smell it from here. It looks pretty clean. Um, I don't think we have to do a lot of cleaning here. That, that may be unnecessary, but especially with the fragile nature of this book, we're going to skip that. But I will do a quick demo just to show you. I know we said we were going to skip cleaning this one, but I do want to show you guys a couple of the tools. Uh, a document cleaning pad, which you can get from Amazon, is very effective, as well as Absorbine paper uh, cleaner. And the Absorbine comes in a tub like this, and you kind of have to get it and use it like Play-Doh. You warm it up with your hands first, give it a nice little, you know, kneading, get it nice and warm, and then what you do is you roll it very slowly and carefully across the book. This is where a lot of people get in trouble, is where they get really aggressive with the putty and they're like, nah, 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 nah. don't do that. You wanna kind of take your glove and just gently go across where you see the dirt, like that, really slowly. There's no need to be super aggressive here. Just right across the spine there where you see some of the dirt collected. And this is not magic. It's not gonna pick everything up. And if you're expecting that, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. But you can kind of see the surface dirt, it does pick up. And be real careful when using this around the edges of the cover, because as you can see right there, it lifts the book up with it. And if you get too aggressive, it lifts the book up and you can really damage the book. So just give it a real quick, well, not quick. I'm contradicting myself. Give it a real careful, cleaning nice and slow like that and then you want to kind of wipe it off with a clean tissue or Swiffer get all the little pieces of the absorbing putty off of it take a look at the front cover the front cover looks very clean I don't really want to mess with that uh, the absorbing pad or the absorbing putty 
Don't reuse it when you're done. You can see the dirt on it. Throw it away. This isn't expensive. You can buy more. You're a high roller. Document cleaning pad is really messy, so get ready for that. It's got a lot of little shavings on it, almost like an eraser, eraser shavings. And you kind of want to go over the book and see the little shavings coming off. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but I can do a close up. You see that? And you just kind of use it like this. Be careful though, because if you get too aggressive, it will take the ink off. Just like that. Nice and clean. And whoever does the housework is going to hate you because there's going to be little shavings everywhere. They're going to be like, why'd you do that? You want to get your shavings off the book completely. I prefer, when I'm in my workspace, I get a little can of compressed air and I shoot it. Compressed air can be your best friend. There we go, nice and clean. Really important to get all that debris off because if you don't, when you go to press the book, there's a chance that you could press some of that debris into the book and that completely defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do here. So make sure it's super clean. All that stuff is off. Double check it, triple check it. You can't check it enough. See, there's still some here. Now it's time to put your book in the humidity chamber. So here's what you need to do that. You've got a grill grate, kind of like you use to put vegetables on your barbecue grill. You can get these on uh, Amazon really cheaply. You need two magazine backing boards in paper and a clean towel. I prefer using towels from Hilton Hotels. So just lay the towel on your grate like that. Lay one of the backing boards on the grate and then put your book on top of the backing board. I always do a final check for any dirt too at the same time. Make sure I got all those little bits off. And then put the other backing board on top. What this is doing, it's protecting the book from any water droplets or condensation that may fall from the humidity chamber. And you don't want it to land on your book because that's not gonna be good. And then you just kind of tuck it in. Good night, little book. Okay, so now we've got our humidity chamber, which is basically just one of those tubs that you can buy at Target or Walmart. Some chip clips that you can get at CVS or Walgreens or Target. And most importantly, distilled water. Not any other kind of water except distilled water. This keeps the book from getting stained or anything should uh, any minerals or deposits happen which can happen with regular water or non-distilled water. You've got your four uh, cylinders that kind of keep the book up above the water. And you've got, for what I prefer is, I like to do um, eight cups of distilled water for four hours. That seems to be the best benefit for me. I, I see some people have different formulas. If you look at Captain Mike's book, he'll give you a whole bunch of options. But for me, I find four hours with eight cups of distilled water is just enough to get the book to a really nice pressable point. So we got everything set up here. We take our book and our grate with our towel and our backing boards, set it right there on the cylinders, close our book up, and then we put the distilled water on top to kind of seal it. And then we put our chip clips around just to kind of create an airtight seal to make sure none of that precious, precious humidity slips out. So don't be afraid to use your chip clips. 
and then we let this bad boy sit for four hours. Many unbearable hours later. Okay, now our book is out of the humidity uh, chamber and you'll see it shouldn't be damp, but it should have like a heavier feel to it. You shouldn't have any kind of dampness or wetness on it, but it should actually feel heavier because the pages are now infused with some humidity. And you can see that any kind of bends will be really pronounced now. They'll actually look a little worse than they did before, and that's normal. It should be that way because that means the book has plenty of moisture, and that means it will also react better to the heat and the pressure of your press. So now you've got your book out. You want to have a little stack made that you can use for the press. Three magazine size backing boards, a piece of silicone release paper, and I like to put those on top of a paper towel and you'll see why after I get everything together here. But I've got my three magazine backing boards, my silicone release paper to make sure the book doesn't stick to this. Now you've got your book you want to put another magazine backing board in the center fold. That's to keep the staples from getting uh, sunk in into the book and, and giving it a real bad overly pressed look. You want to make sure that you give the staples room to be staples pretty much, you know. So there's the center fold. Some great uh, Dick Ayers art here. And you got right in there. Make sure you've got plenty of room at the top and bottom. So that's supporting the staples. You then want to put some 60 pound paper between the back cover and the back page like that. And you want to do the same thing with the front cover and the first page like this. So you've got your book in a little stack here on top of your silicone release paper and your three backing boards, just like that. Everything is all lined up nicely. You then put another piece of silicone release paper on the top of the book, and then you finish it off with three more backing magazine size backing boards on top. Just like that, you made a little book sandwich here. And now you'll see why I like the paper towels because you've got this stacked up. You don't want to try to lift it up and get everything all off center. So what I do is I just end up sliding the paper towel just like this, then to the edge of the table, and then I can grab the whole thing and get a real good grip on it. Now comes the fun part, pressing the book. Uh, all sorts of different presses out there. I have a Seal Compress 110S. I love this thing. I've had it for... 10 years, it is a real workhorse. <laughs> yes, I have Showgirls on DVD. <laughs> uh, and it just, you know, it never fails me. It is really consistent, the temperature is consistent, the pressure is consistent, and I've got it down to a science. One thing you should absolutely do with your press is make sure that the temperature is properly calibrated. And you can do that by buying these little temperature strips off of Amazon. And what you do is you just put it in the press in the middle of a backing board for a few minutes, let it heat up, and then you can get an accurate feel for the temperature. Now, for a silver or bronze age book, you wanna use 165 degrees for 15 minutes. So I have my press preheated to 165 degrees. I have my little stack that I made in here ready to go. And because this is the seal press, I don't have to adjust the pressure or anything. It's already preset the way I like it. And there are really detailed descriptions on how to set the pressure for your particular press in Captain Mike's book, which I, I can't recommend enough, but we're ready to go. So you just close that lid tight, clamp her down. And 15 minutes later, we'll come and check on the press. 15 minutes later. Okay, now that our 15 minutes is up, we have turned our press off and we leave it. We don't touch it. We're gonna leave it in the press just like it is. Still pressed down, still sealed. And we're gonna let it cool off for 12 hours. Many unbearable hours later. Good morning, everybody. Let's check on the book and see how we did. Okay, we've got the press preheated to 165 again. 
So let's swing our little plate in away and check on the book. And remove the backing boards carefully and the SRP paper. What you're going to do is definitely throw this SRP paper away. Don't reuse it because it gets wrinkled and there's a chance that the book can uh, inherit those wrinkles from the uh, SRP paper. So just use it once. And we're gonna lift the book up, place it to the side, get rid of this SRP paper. Place our new SRP paper down. Flip the book and replace it. Let's take a look. If you can see, we're already doing a good job on getting rid of those really deep indentions. In fact, they seem to be pretty much gone already, but we still have another 12 hours to press this side. So let's do that. Another piece of that clean, new SRP paper. We replace our backing boards. Let's make sure everything is straight here. SRP paper, make sure, there you go. That's why you use magazine size, so you have a little more room to work with than just the book size in case something doesn't quite light up, you're still safe. Close this bad boy. <laughs> for 15 minutes, and then we'll turn it off and let it sit another 12 hours. Many hours later. Okay, so after 12 hours in each side in the press, here we are. Why 12 hours each side? Well, that helps keep the book from reverting back to its wrinkled state that it was in before. If you leave it a good 12 hours on each side in the press, that's gonna help minimize any chance of reversion. So right now we're looking pretty good. Uh, it's looking really, really clean, really flat. And what about those deep indentions, indentations in the back? They're gone. Look at that. So all the spine issues that we had before are now resolved. Uh, and you know, it still has that really deep fold where somebody had folded the entire book. You know, pressing is not a magic bullet that's gonna solve everything, but it does present a lot better now, and we will put this uh, in a nice Mylar so it presents nicely. We will send it over to CGC, and we will see what happens. Oh, here she is, Strange Tales 115, Origin of Doctor Strange, early Spider-Man appearance, second appearance of the Sandman, strangely enough. It looks good now. We've got the little label there so I can keep track. And I am going to send this off with my next value submission, and we will keep you guys posted as to what grade it comes back in. I'm a little iffy if it's going to get a bump because I'm going to be honest with you, Richard, 4.5 after seeing that big fold diagonally through the book, I kind of think it got a gift grade. Yeah, that's, that's so, going to be tough. Uh, 4.5 is an interesting grade. I mean, it's hard to get, come up uh, from that. So we'll see. We'll see, but you have to admit it definitely looks better now. Oh, absolutely. Those pinches along the, along the spine on the back were so pronounced previously. It's, yeah, it's and they're gone job. now, so that's fantastic. So I'm sending it off value. So what will happen first? Will I get my books back from CGC or will we have a vaccine? That's a good question. CGC right now, just to, uh, for the people that may, may not be watching this uh, timely, has some really, really slow turnaround. So we're, we're suffering through that. So hopefully they'll, they'll get their act together and get these books back before Christmas. It is like molasses. <laughs> but, you know, since we can't control the way time works uh, forward, maybe we can go into the past with the 25-year rule. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Right. Let's take the misty curtains of time and draw them open and peer into 1995, 25 years ago, when comic shops were closing left and right across this nation. Uh, image was hurting. Books were shipping late. Grunge was taking over. Bands like Sponge were on MTV. 
Uh, the Lemonheads were on MTV. I don't know what else was happening. But, hey, we had lots of weird stuff going on 25 years ago that maybe you can leverage and take advantage of today. We're going to always shine a spotlight on some of these strange underserved books at that time, and this week is no exception. So in 1994, G.I. Joe was canceled. Issue 155 was the last issue, and two months later, in February of 1995, this book appeared, G.I. Joe Special Number 1. What was the purpose of this book? Why did it come out two months after the regular title was canceled? What's going on? All right, there's a few things going on here. First of all, look at that cover. Does that seem familiar to you? That is an homage cover by a guy named Phil Gossier, who, yep, God bless you. I never heard of this guy and I don't know <laughs> where he's at now. But it's obviously a takeoff of Todd McFarlane's cover for Spider Man number one. And you've got snake eyes in that same pose that Spider Man's in. It's a really cool cover. Why was this book? out with this cover because the inside was an issue of gi joe that was drawn by todd mcfarlane years before it was supposed to be issue number 62 and for some reason editorial completely rejected the art and never printed it and they had the complete issue redrawn by marshall rogers and this sat in a drawer for years uh guess what it's 1995 now todd mcfarland's probably the hottest artist on the planet we have this whole issue of gi joe drawn by this superstar artist let's put it out and since we can't get him to draw, draw a new cover we'll have this unknown dude basically trace it and make it <laughs> make eyes instead Oh, so it's crazy. It's a crazy book. But I can tell you from my experience, Richard, when I see this in shows uh, on a dealer's board, it's got a hefty price tag on it. It's tough to get in high grade because no one cared about G.I. Joe at this point. And this never stays up on a dealer's board for long. Yeah, this is one of those early uh, homages to that to that uh, Spider-Man cover. You, you see this cover swipe over and over and over and over again nowadays but back then it was it was brand new and like you say having todd's art in in a book it was a slam dunk last raw sale uh on ebay was 160 dollars the 9.8 went for 575 dollars wow and the gpa is four 460 over the last 12 months so there's definitely a rise in the, in the, the value of this book it's crazy. I have never uh, held one. I've seen one, like I've said, it shows on a dealer's board, but I've never seen it last very long. I've never seen one in the wild. So if you have a chance and you see this G.I. Joe special, number one, by all means, grab it. But good luck. I don't think there's a lot of them out there. And knowing is half the battle. Okay, now let's move on to our <laughs> underrated book of the week. Why don't you start us off? I am going to reveal one of my secret books this oh. is something that i have yeah I, I, I was i was reluctant to talk about this book because i still think it's such a huge opportunity but Wait, I wish. do i need to pause and go on ebay right now and buy this book before they're all gone <laughs> you might want to <laughs> okay go ahead, go ahead. Uh, as, as everyone knows um i'm really bullish on champions the, the original champion series from or the second series with all of the, the the teen stars that we've been talking about, I think that is a hot series. Digging deeper into the, the the books that are available for the series, I found something really interesting. Back in 2016 at the New York Comic Con, there is a diamond reseller meeting, and at that meeting, they gave out four comic books that were only available at that particular meeting. Four separate comics. There were sketch covers. They were a connecting cover. So the four comics, when they put them in four, you know, two by two, made one giant image. The covers were all done by Art Adams, one of my favorite art, uh, artists. There was Jessica Jones, number one. There was Cage, number one. There was Death of X, number one. And then there was Champions, number one. Oh, wow. Yeah. So of those four books, I'm looking at that Champions, number one. I went around and did some sleuthing. I, I spent the most of most of this weekend trying to track this down. This book, <laughs> <And> find them all. <laughs> <laughs> this book um, was a teaser for a series called Monster Unleashed that was going to be released in, in 2017. 
So these books were out there for the resellers, uh, the, the retailers to get excited about that. So the covers were all in, inspired by Monsters Unleashed. This book, the, these four books, I'm going to talk specifically about Champions number one. It is a ghost. Trying to find this book is very difficult. First of all, it is not listed in GoCollect's database. Wow. Uh, it does exist in, in Cover Price's database, uh, but there are no sales for this book. Therefore, it's not in GPA either. So if you don't know about this book, it's really, really hard to find information about it. I looked in CGC. CGC has four, four <laughs> graded 9.8 copies. And that's it. No other books are, are graded. I looked around Comic Realm and the Comic Database. I, I, I did searches by the by the uh, UPC code to, to find and link more information. When this set came out, Bleeding Cool gave this set a, a value of about four hundred dollars. Since then, <laughs> it's 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 gone down. Uh, there's been some sales of this book for as low as thirty dollars in the past past thirty days. Uh, there right now is a set up on eBay of all four books at nine point eight at at. $1,350. At least it, it is there now. <laughs> I'm <laughs> contemplating buying it. Uh, just to give you some idea of the rarity. Okay, there's four 9.8s for this book in, in, in CGC census. The one in 1,000 Hawthorne variant, which is the, the famous Deadpool variant where Deadpool is standing amongst... One in 1,000 or one in 100? It is one in 1,000. My show, show wow. notes are wrong. Wow. One in, one, one in 1,000. There are 60 graded books in the census for that book, 60 versus four. So give you some idea of the rarity of this book. So definitely, if you come across this book, either on eBay or through, through some other source, pick it up because just the sheer rarity of this book, uh, when Champions actually starts to get on the front burner for Marvel and we see more Marvel MCU entrances for Kamala Khan or any of these characters, uh, you'll you'll see these champions book in, you know increase in value, and if you're looking at the rarest champions book on the market, it has to be this New York Comic Con 2016 uh, retailer variant. I, I really cannot find anything that has less than four on the census. I don't doubt it because that other the other big New York Comic Con variant that everybody wants is that Black Panther number one J Scott Campbell oh, Shuri yeah. sketch variant, and that one goes for big dollars, and it's hard to find. So these NYCC variants was that the same year twenty sixteen? It might even be the same year. I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, they're not out there a lot. Uh, I wonder. I'm going to go on the Midtown Comics and see if it's on there. Mm, they're in New York. I had already looked. Damn it. <laughs> well, mine is not as sexy and cool as that book, but it is uh, one that you may not know about. And brace yourself uh, because it's not Quasar, it's not Hercules, it is something even more bizarre. And I need you to stay with me on this one. It is Flaming Carrot number twenty-seven. Why is Flaming Carrot twenty-seven my underrated book of the week? Because it is a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles crossover, and this is the all Todd episode. It has a Todd <laughs> Harley cover. And as far as I can tell, and people, please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. This is the only time Todd McFarlane has drawn the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, at least on a cover. So you've got those two things happening with this book. And then you've got a low print run because this is in the Dark Horse era when Flaming Carrot was not the critical favorite it once was, you know, a couple years ago with the Aardvark, Aardvark Vanaheim series. And let's throw in a super tough black bordered cover in there <laughs> too. And you've got a fire tornado as we have out here in California <laughs> of the collectability. Now the GPA is for a 9.8 is only $80. But if you go on eBay right now, there's only one 9.8 slab up there and they're asking 200 for it. So, Flaming Carrot number 27, a very underlooked, underrated Turtles book, a McFarlane cover, a black cover, a low print run. I think you might want to snag this one as well. Absolutely. Flaming Carrot, that is that is such, uh, brings back such memories from that era. Fortune favors the bold, says Bob Burton. <laughs> and, you know, that's going to do it for us this week. I want to remind everybody I'm hosting the $10 live sale for Minor Keys Comics this Wednesday, September 16th, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Join him on Instagram at Minor Keys Comics. I'll be there. I'll be snarky. It'll be fun. Get some books. 
and we will see you next time. Stay safe, everybody.